Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon Listeners. For artists that want to follow a realistic style, I don't know that you necessarily have to overthink about an influence like me or any other painter who does realism. You can certainly get a lot from the pieces that we've done, maybe even imitate some of those compositions, but I think you'll find your own way once you're just studying reality, which is what I would do. I mean, if I'm going to look at people, things, photographs, it's beneficial to start shooting your own, if you can get into that. And these days, since everybody's got a camera, that's not so much of an issue anymore. Um, being able to study life as the basis for something is the best. I had the longest problem of thinking I needed to have everybody and every element be perfect before I could use it as a reference source. And so it took me a long time to realize how flexible the basis of the human form is. I've posed for myself on loads of paintings where now I guess I'm called out by some people online. It's a process of getting your mind comfortable with what you're building off of. And at a certain point, I would say, accept that you're going to feel like you're not seeing it until you've seen it. You know, that maybe you do need to have a thing look like a thing exactly before you're, you're painting from it. Ironside will not be seen tonight, so we may bring you the following special program. A super good evening to all of you. Welcome back. It's Word Balloon Live, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here. Very happy to welcome back Philip Kennedy Johnson. Great to see you, Philip. Great to see you, John. How's everything going? Doing all right, man. Uh, loving your story. Uh, I, uh, Man, uh, the black cloud over Superman uh, continues to uh, shadow him. And oh, I, don't, I don't know what you mean. Did something happen this week? <laughs> <laughs> well, certainly there was a reaction. To uh, to the story that you and Tom Taylor and everybody uh, laying out and stuff, and uh, JP is very sad that uh, we're not going to get Ironside tonight. Yeah, I'm sorry. Man. <laughs> sorry. Ray, Ray, Raymond Burr needed a break tonight. So anyway, um, I I do want to talk about what's you know happening in the book beyond the fact that that we have a, a revelation, a slow revelation that that John is a bisexual. But really, I want to talk about Clark's story for a second. Because uh, Clark is uh, going off for a mission. And I mean, I really love this younger uh, Mongol that has, uh, you know, replaced his father and a much more dangerous Mongol, it seems. And one that isn't afraid of Superman and then is very, uh, you know, ready ready to fight him. And it's, uh, I mean, these guys are really eyeballing each other. And, you know, we're about to finally get uh, Superman leaving for War World with apparently the authority with them. Yeah. Yeah, I know there's a lot of questions. Yeah, yeah. you know, uh, uh, because is this a prequel to Grant's story? Explain the connection to Grant's. No, I um, man, what can I reveal? Um, I because it's there's a moment in 1036 where it all kind of comes together and everything makes sense. And I know it seems like it's just there's just too much dissonance. Like there's just how can these possibly be the same story? Um, and I will say, I mean, Grant had a very specific story that they wanted to tell. And, and I had mine, but we but we talked and tried to figure out a way to feather them together. And when I when I first read what Grant was going to do, I like everyone, I assumed it was going to be out of continuity because it was it was so it was so Grant, right? I mean, it was just so creative and every these huge bombastic ideas and the whole thing is like this love letter to the Silver Age, and uh, like everything was on the table the whole time, <clears throat> and um, it just seemed crazy that it would be the same Superman that we're 
that we're um, whose story we're telling. Hey, what's up, Chris? Um, the same story that we're telling in Action Comics, but um, but Grant really wanted the story to count to matter. You know, like this is not a, an Elseworlds thing. This is a story that's happening in in continuity, and that was that was really important to Grant. And I'm not going to tell Grant Morrison shit about how to write Superman. <laughs> I mean, All Star is one of my top five Superman stories ever, and it's an honor to talk to them always. Like every time we have a conversation, it's a, it's a lesson in Superman. They have so much knowledge about Superman and so much love for Superman, um, especially Silver Age stuff. And I just learn so much every time we talk. Um, nothing but respect. And when they say that they wanted this to, to be the same character and um, I was like, cool, let's make it work. Let's do this. And it was exciting. It was exciting to get to work with Grant on anything, but to, um, to, to have the challenge of these two stories that are so different and told in different voices too, and bring them together into one thing, but we're doing it. So, I mean, for someone who, for the readers that go in, who just can't get past certain like differences, who are like are looking to get to be pissed, they'll find a little different. Like they'll find some little nugget in something. It's like, well, how, yeah, but what about an action thirty ten thirty two? It says this other thing, and it's not quite the same. Um, I mean, it's it's comics, and Grant has such a clear vision that they wanted to achieve, and. Um, and we we made a lot, we both a lot of made, made a lot of concessions to bring it together into one story, um, but yeah, it, I promise it'll make sense in in uh, in ten thirty six. And it's if it's if it's not the version I've seen a lot of theories online actually, and I will say I saw a theory that's pretty much correct. Interesting. Um, yeah, but there are others too that um, that are super wild and honestly, I, I I admire a lot of the things I've seen. People are just like, what if it was this? And it's awesome ideas and i love seeing people so like into it and enthused like yeah. that's you know, that's the kind of fanhood i want to see you know like uh people just really excited and loving it and just trying to think of how how something could be could be true um i love seeing that and um i there you know people will be like oh it's not what i imagined and i'm sure people will be like well, mine's better but uh i hope you hope your hope fans are are pleased with what grant and i decided to do together because I'm, I'm very proud of it and um it's important to me that down the line, like, you know, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years down the line, someone can pick up just the action comic run and uh, without knowing that Superman of the Authority ties into it and just read it and it's its own thing and it works. Or it could pick up Superman of the Authority by itself and not need action. And that one works sure. too. Um, I, it's I'm, We're kind of playing the long game and I, I want to think about the books on the shelf later, not just the monthlies that, I mean, not, we obviously we're not ignoring that, but. Uh, eventually they're all going to be books on the shelf and we want, I want them to work on their own. And I think they, they definitely do that. And I think they still tie together awfully well too, for what we, for the stories we told. Understood. I'm going to let Jared ask a question right away because I love that it was touched on in uh, the annual along with uh, future state as well. But Jared wants to know, will we see the house of hell anytime soon? Great world building that you <clears throat> started in future state. Thank you so much. It was, yeah, I love those characters and I, I love that they, um, Jamie Rich, the editor was actually like, we got an annual coming up. I want you to do house of L. And I was so stoked about that. I didn't know if they'd let me. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, in, in a perfect world where everything goes exactly how I want it to, um, if, you know, if action comics existed in a vacuum and I'm not, you know, interplaying with other writers and their stories too, which of course we are. Um, there would be one gigantic tome at the, at the end of all my Superman stuff that all ties together. And every piece that you see um, from future state on is all one story. Um, so yeah, ideally uh, I would love to bring house of L back into it. And I think I'm going to get to, so yeah, you'll in some capacity, you'll see house of L again. That's great, man. And truly uh, I was telling Bendis, that I really love what he's done to expand the DC cosmic uh, universe. And I agree. And uh, you know, you're, you're another guy that obviously is, is doing this as well with this story and the house of L and everything that's coming up. And it's just, it really does expand the, the mythos in, in a really interesting way. John uh, Roca, I, I think this is if JP Roca, if you're not John Roca, <clears> forgive <throat> me, but he says he likes the, uh, the, that the action is sticking to monthly uh, for stronger storytelling and not going twice a month. But he says it would be cool to see more than one super, Superman story a month. Okay. Um, there's other Superman's appearing in other stuff um, going coming going forward too. He is well. I have an issue actually coming out. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, 
November, sorry, let me think, which November 2nd, actually, in a couple of weeks, well, um, there's going to be, um, what's it called? Batman, Superman, and the Authority. So that actually ties together. It kind of goes in between um, action 1035 and 1036. <clears throat> so in 1035, you see, you know, Superman kind of says bye with the Justice League and they all leave and Batman, he turns around and Batman's there oh, rather than disappearing for once. <laughs> <clears throat> and he says, um, don't do this. This is stupid. And Superman's like, I'm doing it. And he's like, okay, well, see, he tells Batman, like, say what you really are here to say. Like, you can't lie to me. And he's like, okay, fine. I have intelligence that says that you have, you put another team together for this. He's like, yes. And Batman says, tell me about him. So Batman has a gig that he, that needs doing. And for whatever reason, they can't use the Justice League. And um, it turns out to be the authority. And that is the November 2nd story that we're telling. And this is really stoked. I, I'm, I'm really excited about this. So it was going to be with Trevor Harrison. Wow. And, and then, well, I mean, it is with Trevor, but then it came at some point we got the word like Trevor actually can only do, it's a double sized book and Trevor's good for half of it. We're going to bring in another issue, another artist for the other half. <laughs> what about Ben Templesmith? And I was like, what? <laughs> like, that's, that's great. not match at all. Like, but then we kind of thought about, it, I was like, that's actually brilliant. What if we, instead of, what if we made it a feature, not a bug and like really play, because we had enough lead time that we could make it work. So I just kind of paper wadded the idea that I was putting together for it. And I was like, let's find a story that is meant to be done by two different artists who are wildly different because both of those guys are brilliant artists, um, but nothing alike. So we came up with this story that we're telling in Batman Superman, the authority. And I'm, it was such, um, such an inspiring, like energizing um, way to put together a story to, to know that, <clears throat> to have the challenge of working for two artists, but also to make sure that both of them get almost exactly 20 pages. So they both get what they were promised as far as like, you know, the paycheck. Sure. Um, but it worked out. I, I, I was really happy with how it came out and uh, both of them just completely crushed it. I, I can't wait for people to see it. That's great, man. And I, Ben's an old friend. So there's another excuse. Ben's super cool. Uh, I was hanging out yeah. with him a lot actually at New York comic con last weekend. He's, he's a really cool guy. Um, and there's other issues out there too. Of course I did not write like, um, let me think. So anyway, that's so that issue I was just talking about. That's like the that's the Batman Superman the authority is like kind of the, the authority's trial run before they go off to War World and then go straight into War World the next week. So the following uh, issue 1036, which is the first issue finally of the War World saga that we've been building to all year for eight, for like a complete year. We've been building up to this this moment. Yeah. That comes out the following week, November 9th. I think right now in previews it says 20 the 26 or something, but it got pushed back a little bit. So that now the Batman Superman of the Authority comes out one week earlier, and then this, and then uh, ten thirty seven will be probably a couple weeks after that. That sounds great, man. No, I have um, a, I have a feeling we might have to talk at the end of the year before. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know so. story wise oh, where man. it would make sense. Such exciting stuff coming, and there's, we just cool, got man. got an announcement that Dan Moore is going to be drawing a world's finest book. Oh with, wow! With Batman and Superman. And I'm a complete lame ass and I can't remember who's writing it because I just saw that today. I remember Dan Mora's art. I can't remember who's writing it now offhand. Well, I imagine Chip, going it. Go, I, want was it? I, I want to say it's Chip, but I'm not sure. Oh, Zdarsky. That's cool. Oh, that's ironic. I uh, I must have my, my crystal ball must be working because I wanted to talk to him about uh, some other stuff that they've announced for Chip. I could be wrong, but I, my my gut's telling me Chip and Dan Mora. And it looks, I mean, obviously it looks amazing and I'm sure it'll be great. Oh, uh, 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 Roka here says it's uh, Mark Wade that's uh, writing that World's Finest. Oh, great. Awesome. Which is fantastic. Absolutely. And Caesar agrees. It's Mark Wade. Absolutely. Very good. Cool. Yeah, Wade has, writes some of my some of my favorite Superman scenes ever. So he's probably yeah, listening I was, and he's yeah. pissed. <laughs> no, I, 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 I think I, I don't know if I've ever mentioned it to you, but I've told Mark there's this great short story collection of prose Superman short stories. And there's one called Forget Me Not. And it's all about like uh, Superman is like, well, maybe I'm too complicated for is when they're still dating. Uh -huh. And uh, maybe Lois's life would be better without me. And this magician makes it happen. Huh. And and huh. she's living, living, you know, I mean, she's still a Daily Planet reporter, has no re memory of, of their relationship. And then as the story goes on, Superman starts forgetting things because it's really taking effect. And mm -hmm. it's magic. Sure. So he's got to, you know, he's got to stop from having, it's just an adorable story. And I, yeah. I do. And, and man, I got to tell you, you're putting a lot of great character moments in here. And that's why I say 
the long shadow because clearly, I mean, you got to be an idiot not to see all the uh, foreshadowing of this is bad. Please don't do this. And then <laughs> we have right. what we've, if people haven't read Future State, I encourage you to because, yeah, this is bad. And, you know, and the, and the league, you, I mean, you give a very plausible reason. It's like, Hey man, you know, you, you pissed off the world with all these moves that you've been making, which is rare, but now everyone's kind of anti Superman and the league can't, they can't uh, do anything right now. Yeah. I've, I've been pretty vocal about, well, I mean, when asked at least um, about like liking my Superman to be the one who always shows us the way and knows what to do. <clears throat> and, um, that was the choice he made to save lives. And he, he understood that it would be, you know, a problem, but it's that or watch. I mean, they were, they were taking shots like all around him and, and Kara and, and John. So it's like, it's, it's that, or lots of people die. So he just did it. And this, this is the price. Um, yeah. So, uh, well, I'm very excited to see Wade's story with, especially with, with Dan Mora. I mean, both of them are, you know, virtuoso. So it's very stuff to see that Wade wrote some of my favorite Superman scenes. Uh, those those key moments I'm always trying to go for in in a comic where you just get the chills. I'm like, oh god, I just want to be like that. Um, I, I just love those moments, and, and Wade totally gets it. I mean, right down to the end of Irredeemable, right? Like it's the way he he worked Superman into that story. It was like, you know, that just clearly this is a man who loves Superman and, and gets him. So I'm with you. Um, this feels like a spoiler question. You can choose to answer it or not, but I will sure. allow Radium to ask the question. Is Future State War World a timeline where Superman and the Authority failed to defeat Mongol? Um, uh, what should I say? I mean, certainly in the short term. Okay. Because, I mean, if, if, they, if they go up to War World and just knock him down like a bowling pin, then... What's the point? Yeah, there's he wouldn't be there still, right? So yeah, yeah he certainly, yeah. Well, there's a story to be told, and that's that's what I would say to Radium is, how about being patient? And you're not, not the no no disrespect when I say that, but the story comes out monthly. Keep reading. Yeah, totally. You know, I mean, I I, I really I, I just you know, can we get to the last chapter? And I'm Radium. For you. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. No, just the, in, the, that, in that version that you saw in Future State, then yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, obviously, sure. a, a defeat has happened at some point. <laughs> Sure. Um, but um, yeah, it's just uh, the story that we're telling going forward is much more complicated. So it's it's a question that doesn't really have uh, an answer as as such. That's great to hear. That's fantastic to hear. So that's wonderful. You know, uh, again, uh, man, just a lot of sad. I mean, everyone's just kind of <laughs> waiting for the worst to happen. Unfortunately, beautiful scene with Lois and Clark uh, at the end of uh, thirty. Was it uh, thirty three? Ten thirty three. At the end of ten thirty five, thirty five. When, um, when they when they go into the clouds and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that was that yeah. was really fun. I um, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of people who like when I first you know came out as being like, hey, we're going to War World. There was some. There's a small, you know, number of people who were like just really upset because like that means you know there's no place for Lois in a story like that. <clears throat> and obviously, the, the Lois and Clark mythology is super important to to Clark's character. And um, the thing is. She, um, oh, cool. Um, <laughs> I figured that said it um, all. Yeah, Radium wants us to know it's speculation, with spoiler. <laughs> yeah, he's loving the story. Good, right. I'm glad. Very well, good. I mean, I it is not lost on me, um, how important Lois is, and I do not, in fact, hate the character, <laughs> despite what everyone says. Sure. Everyone, but like some, some people were like, you know, House of L shows like Superman's just been banging everyone for the last thousand years, and like <laughs> Lois is out of the picture. And, <laughs> Clearly, this is <laughs> clearly this is PKJ's own twisted fantasy, and like it's Jesus. Uh, wow. Yeah, it's, well, you know, whatever. It's the internet. It's fine. But yeah, it's, I know. Um, but good lord, Lois oh is great, god. and I I used her a lot in in War World Rising, and I hope people see how I feel about Lois as a character yeah. and how Clark feels about her. And um, I will say, my initial the one one big problem with my initial uh, vision for War World Saga, I was like, how are we gonna like it is a kind of a problem that Lois is not around in the story because she's so important. Sure. But since since then, has been fleshing out what comes next. Um, that problem has kind of been solved. So wonderful. That's yeah. great, man. Yeah, because I mean, and I and believe me, just like Alfred was always Batman's conscience, Lois is Superman's conscience. Yeah. And and yeah. and I mean, and truly again in 35, 
she cuts right to the shit and everything and is like, you know, uh, you know, what are you doing or whatever? And also she's got to be a rock for John. Right. I mean, and John, you know, good Lord. It's so, yeah. I mean, it, I think it's a very good complicated story from a character standpoint. And also, I mean, so is future is, is Superman who is likely immortal supposed to live like millennium without a, a, a partner or other partners right. because he fell in love with this mortal. I, I'm sorry. I don't buy that. Yeah. I mean, in, in my, in my vision of the future, like I've been very, I've been kind of cagey about not wanting to show people the family tree that I wrote out for sure. Because sure. people want to see it. Well, and, yeah, um, no, there's a lot of mystery there when, yeah, when I, I, I have a, it happened. Absolutely. I have a very specific family tree with like years in which things happen <laughs> and all that. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm not going to lock in every writer that ever comes after me because, first of all, they're not going to give a shit. I mean, like, if no. you know, nobody, nobody's going to respond, well, this is what PKJ said, like, back in the whatevers. So now I have to do it. They're going to do whatever works best for their story, and they should. Okay. So I'm not going to put that out there just to be shot down and then completely not matter ever again. Um, but I will say that not every one of those, like, we in House of L, we do not see all of the L's who are alive at that time. Um, in that story, there are others also. And... I'll also say that they are not all descended from Lois. Like not all, like she is, I mean, she, she's definitely in the lineage, but if he, if he lives another thousand years past that, it's very plausible to me that, that he would potentially, you know, fall in love again, like sure. literally centuries later. I mean, I don't think anyone could judge him for that. No, I'll tell you the truth, man. When uh, uh, JT Kroll was writing uh, the Batman beyond universe version of Superman, um he lois was dead there he decides to come back to earth and creates a new human secret identity for himself and kind of falls i mean he's and he's clearly a senior citizen kind of falls in love with a a volunteer firewoman that is kind of approaching senior years Mm. and it's like yeah i mean it's and, and i guess maybe because my mother passed away young my father after several years found love again and remarried and it's like yeah good jesus yeah. why would why would we deny this from superman again i understand lois is his soulmate but yeah totally you know again hundreds of years later who's to say and i love the idea of this possible you know where this lineage can come from and i want the mystery it's like i didn't need to know that uh you know wolverine logan was james whatever the hell his last name how it yeah yeah how it thank you yeah I, um, I didn't need to know. It was I, know our, there's people, I, like the I know there's people out there who are like screaming in their mind that I said that in my opinion he marries again, and I because because Pl- Lois and Clark is like this iconic couple. Um, I really like that people can make their own choices in the story. Like just because I wrote a thing doesn't mean I own it forever. Sure. I mean that's how my interpretation of the thing that I wrote is that not all those people are descended from Lois, but most of them are. Okay. And. Um, I like like, like for, Brandon Kent, for example, from the annual, I believe was his name. What about him? Wasn't wasn't Brandon Kent? Do we know? Do I mean you're not the answer, by the way. I don't want to say who everyone's like where they come from and all that, but yeah, he's um <laughs> he's clearly anyway. an earth uh yeah, okay. clearly he's human and he's like yeah. he's a farmer too. By the when we see him in the first one, he's gone back to he's given up the pageantry of the costume and stuff, and he's just a guy who just like wears you know, work boots and jeans, but he still has these powers. I really like that character a lot. Absolutely, man. Yeah. Um, Grace Cincinnatus, the uh, Roman emperor who uh, goes back to his farm. After, yeah, exactly. Kind of yeah. I really like Brandon a lot. And it was fun to get to show him as, as his Superman um, in the, in the annual as well. Yeah. But So I, um I heard a, uh, an interview in which somebody asked uh, George Miller, director of the Mad Max films said, there was a theory out there that the Tom Hardy Max in Fury Road was actually the, the little wild kid from one of the previous movies who sure. grew up to become Max, another Max himself. And he, you could tell that George had not considered that possibility, but he really seemed to like it. And he was like, huh. And he, he kind of thought for a minute and he was like, that is not how I perceived it. But he, uh, but he went on to say that he really liked it. Yeah. You were, viewers can have their own versions of things and it's perfectly valid. And he said he, that he supported that choice. That he supported that interpretation. And that would be mine too. Like if, if any readers want to decide, decide for themselves that everyone in that, in that family tree is all Lois's, you know, descendants. I'm totally fine with that. That's, th- that's literally the biggest part of the reason why I don't want to reveal the family tree that I have in my mind. 
because I'm not, you know, I'm, there's like death dates and stuff in there that are in my mind set in stone that one day will change. And that's why I want to keep it more nebulous. I understand, man. And I love that road warrior theory because, uh, you know, yeah, he's the, he, the kid is the narrator of yeah. uh, the second movie. Right. So it does kind of make plausible sense that he grew up to be Tom Hardy's character. That's yeah, I like, I like that theory too. Very cool. I had no idea. That's awesome, man. Uh, yeah, uh, B thinks says it's always interesting and weird to think about the lives of characters who live for millennia. Absolutely, and that's why there are just so many possibilities that we saw going back to Grant's one million uh, story about Superman and everything. And it's I love that you're kind of expanding on on it in your way through Future State and obviously what you're doing with uh, with the main books. No, I th I think it's great. Yeah, thank you. I yeah I I love House of L, and we're gonna bring him back in if I can at all. I I'm pretty sure we're going to be able to. Um, again, I don't, eh, I, you know, I'm going to, I'll throw it up there. Sure. Caesar to me again, this is a spoiler question, but I'll throw it up there. Is John still alive during uh future state? Uh, I can't say, I'm sorry. There you go. Thank, fa fantastic. Okay. Here's an idea, kids. No spoiler <laughs> questions, please. Moving forward. I think there's a lot to explore here. Uh, I, and truly, I, I think of what's been laid out and let's talk about what's laid out rather than what's coming next. Because, and I understand, man, everybody, Everybody anticipates Christmas Day and they can't wait to see what's under the tree and they'd right. love to see it before Christmas Day. No, I, yeah, I don't, you know. I totally don't mind the questions. If there's one I can't answer, I just won't, and it's totally cool. There you go. Okay, buddy. That's that's cool. And thank you, Philip. Obviously, you're 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 ready. You're you know. Um, so anyway, Magic K, uh, I see a question and I will suggest you rewind because we've already covered that. Moving forward, let's talk about uh, the big explosion this week. Oh my <laughs> god, John Kent. I I get it. I do get it because I'm older, I guess. And people are used to things a certain way. So a son of Superman that suddenly does uh, appear on the horizon and is bisexual, it's like, okay, that's something different. Um, how how was that arrived? I mean, do, were you part of a group where it was discussed? I mean, you know, what what can you say about the choices that have been made for John Kent? Um, when I came on board the Superman team that had been, um, which sounds weird because I was doing both books. You'd think I was like the architect, but they had a plan for where it was going to go after I was doing both. Like I was never meant to do both books forever. I was going to be the action comics guy, you know, for the foreseeable future. And I was going to be doing Superman for about half the year. Um, so I did the future state issues and then, the, you know, 29, 30, 31, 32. And it was all meant to set to set up Tom for success on uh, Son of Kal El, and um, so I got to tell an adventure story between between Clark and his son, which was incredibly rewarding. Because I mean, I, as a father myself, I, I mean, I've talked about that relationship on here before. My son and I are like best friends. He's a huge nerd like I am. He loves this stuff. Loves Superman. Um, so it was that whole thing was. A, um, just a literal open letter to my son. Like he, there was a literal letter, like letter fragments throughout the whole story. Um, as far as his, like that, that aspect of John's character did not come up in my story at all. I didn't want to give any kind of tells or anything. It had nothing to do with the story I was telling. Sure. But um, it was, it had already been discussed clearly by the time I came on to write both titles. And um, I was supportive. I thought it was cool. I thought it made sense. I mean, John has been in the future and the idea was that things are a little looser then. And he's, his, uh, you know, the, the, the environment that he was, that he grew up in was just different than the one that he might've been raised in otherwise. And um, it just seemed to make sense that he would be more open to that kind of stuff. But I honestly, I'm not, I don't want to put words in Tom's mouth. And um, I, I was DC entrusted me with the legacy Superman book with action comics, which is a huge, huge honor. And that's my lane. So I'm I'm writing Clark Kent, the Superman I grew up with, and John being the Superman of Earth for a bit opens us up to tell this sprawling science fiction epic that I wanted to see from Superman like my entire life. <clears throat> uh, meanwhile, in the Hall of Justice, uh, Tom. Meanwhile, yeah, uh, Tom is writing Jonathan. Yeah, and it's none of my business what Tom does with John. I mean, to an extent. I mean, they obviously there's stuff that happens between both books, but the fact that they're splitting us up, splitting them up in the, you know, where they are, um, as Tom's gig. And Tom's a good friend, and we talk a lot. And um, I know that Tom loves Superman as much as I do. 
the Superman mythology mythos as much as I do. That's not something I say lightly either. I mean, I love Superman and Tom does too, every bit as much, um, understands what Superman stands for. He gets it. I trust Tom to write a great story with John. That's great, um, man. Uh, by the way, we were real fast. He's a blurry, forgive me, uh, picture <laughs> of you and your son there. That's great. Yeah. Thanks. He's awesome. That was right before the, the whole COVID thing happened. Like that was, that was Aww. well before I got the, I got the gig. Oh, wow. That's great. Well, there you go, Matt. Foreshadowing you again. That's wonderful. Yeah. Go ahead. But, um, I regarding, interrupted you. regarding my opinion on the decision to make John buy, um, there is something I want to say about that. Um, so there's been a lot of noise about that this week, obviously. <laughs> uh, I mean, why do we have superheroes if not to inspire us, right? And to give us characters that we can see ourselves in doing unbelievable things or a power fantasy in which we can be more than we are. Uh, I mean, more than just good, more than just more than more than great, like more, but heroic on a level that we cannot achieve in everyday life. And when I was a kid, I like I needed that real, real bad. And for me, that was Superman and Batman. Like those guys. I mean, I was a pretty lonely kid, kind of a sad kid, and um, kind of a weak, sickly kid that got, you know, smacked around a lot. I got picked on a lot, and. Um, probably more than any of the other characters I was reading, um, Superman and Batman made my life just so much more livable. Like, as I would just, my whole life was lived, like, in my imagination. It's like pretending that I, that I was Batman, a sad little kid, <laughs> turning himself into this powerful thing that could, you know, through sheer force of will and, you know, insane intensity and hard work and stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with, like, anybody, anything. And on other days, I was this lonely little kid in the country, which I I was also me, you know, that didn't really get the environment that he was in and or feel like he belonged anywhere. And through Superman, I could pretend that I was sent there by people who loved me to help everyone, to save everyone. You know, like it was such a powerful fantasy that I needed really bad. I mean, that's what Superman meant to me. And I'm completely speculating now, but I imagine... Uh, there's a huge population of people out there, kids and adults, you know, whoever, who look at Clark Kent and like him and maybe love him, um, appreciate him for what he stands for, but they don't necessarily connect with him the way that I did. And um, if there are people out there that you can look at John and feel inspired by John the way that I felt inspired by Clark, I mean, if we can give them their own A-list superhero. Like not just take somebody who's like a kind of a tomato can that's been kicked around and like, like oh, we'll just make this person gay. Like, and then we'll, we'll look like we care. <clears throat> if we can make, if we can give them their own A-list superhero that can make their lives better, like the real life lives better, the way that Clark made mine better. Why would we not do that? I mean, we, do we need another Clark Kent who's just kind of younger? I mean, we've already got Clark Kent. I mean, we don't need two. And we're in the superhero business. <laughs> like we're not making, we're not making soap or socks or like, you know, selling insurance. We're, we're telling stories and not just any stories, but like superhero stories. Yeah. Heroic stories. Yeah. That are meant to, whose entire purpose is to inspire people. Agreed. And Jonathan Kent is a beautiful original character, not even that old. And he's a gift, man, to, in my view. Like we have, we can tell, we can make another, we've made another Clark Kent sort of that is different has his own identity and has his own thing that he own things that he cares about has a different way of approaching the superhero gig um i think he's a gift for the world i think i think tom is doing a great job with him i admire what he's done what he's doing with him um i'm a little embarrassed i probably wouldn't have thought to do what he's doing like as far as making him bisexual like it's not my life experience not that it's tom's either but i really admire what he's done um because it now i feel like there's there are going to be readers out there that that suddenly have a Clark Kent that I that I had that I needed so bad I get it man you know it reminds me of uh when I heard Richard Donner before he passed away and he was talking about uh the original casting for Lethal Weapon and uh in his mind he was you know conceiving it as two white guys mm. and, and the casting director is like what about Danny Glover and he goes and I was ashamed of myself and he goes and this is back in the 80s and he's like yeah, of course it could be a white guy and a black guy. Why wouldn't it be a white guy and a black guy? That's that's great. Yeah, and, and you know, and and the relationship they that they projected in that in those series of movies, and I think we're back in a different way with with John Kent, and it's like 
yeah, why not? And and yeah. also, uh, to me, and again, this is my opinion. I think the best way to solve this kind of pushback is to give both uh, the original and the legacy character interesting stories, and to be very careful about not pushing them off stage, because yeah. I think that was that was the mistake that Marvel made a few years ago when they were introducing all their different legacy characters. And it's like, okay, that's fine. I like an Amos, uh, an Amadeus Cho Hulk, but I do like Bruce Banner and I don't, and, and, or even honestly as direct as Riri Williams and Tony Stark. And it's like, I still want Tony Stark stories. Yeah. Happening alongside Riri Williams. Stories. Yeah, me too. And I, I know there are people out there reading this stuff on the internet and hearing this now and be like, yeah, but that character is not for me. Like John, I don't want that. Like that, that character of John Kent, a bisexual character who is on like, who's, you know, at, at rallies and social justice warrior and all that, that is not who I am. It's not what I want for my superheroes. There are people for out there for whom that is true. And that's totally fine because we still have Clark Kent, you know, like we, we have another Superman who's in a ton of books right now, primarily action comics. And he's <laughs> right now he's in the middle of the biggest, most sprawling, inspiring, like space epic he's ever been a part of. I hope that's, that's the goal. Um, John is not the only Superman. And I feel like that's, I mean, you know, everyone in the, the, the titles of all these articles are like Superman's gay now. And like, just try to get sensationalize it and make everyone freak out like they did. That's not the case though. <laughs> that's just not the truth. There's another Superman now and he's bisexual. He's a different character than Clark Kent and no one's ever going to replace Clark Kent. It can't right. be done. And we're right. never going to try not in a lasting way. Superman is forever. I agree with all of that. Absolutely. Um, uh, you know, now Deviant uh, Porg uh, has a good point. Uh, and, and I get what he's saying, and, I, and I'll give my explanation, and I want to hear your explanation. He says, don't you think it might have been better to let the story go and discover it in the book, meaning the comics, instead of the New York Times? Sure, but two things. One, um, you know, yeah, as, as Philip just said, the headlines, oh, Superman's gay. You know, so they want... Um, the newspapers want to provoke you read the article. DC wants to provoke you by perhaps alerting the New York Times to this from a marketing standpoint to get people who aren't reading to say, wow, what's going on with Superman? I might want to read that. So there is this provocation on the part of both the newspaper and the publisher. To, I mean, it's no different than the Batman Catwoman wedding that didn't happen. Um, you know, and yeah, it's, again, it's that line between investing in the soap opera and whatever your level of expectation is, whether it's met or not versus the fact that this is commercial art and they're trying to get the word out that they want to sell more books. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, people talk about this being a money grab and all that. That is, I can tell you from the, the, um, the relationships I have with people at DC comics is that that is just not true. I mean, obviously comics are the, like as Ron Mars has said, probably on the show, um, comics are the joining of art and commerce. Right. Like 100%. it needs to sell to, to exist. Yeah. It's commercial art. Yeah. So um, the announcement, I believe I could be wrong. It's Friday now. I want to say the announcement was made on coming out day, right? October 11th. Probably. And I, you'll forgive me. I, I wasn't paying attention yeah. that it was it's, coming out day, but okay. It struck me as like a celebration of coming out day. And, to, and the fact that it's, not just any character. They're not making Geoforce gay. It's not some some no name character that nobody cares about. So forgive me for any Geoforce fans. I should know better than make comments like that. It's the internet. But um, Superman, like one of our two Superman, is now bisexual and cares about social justice and all that. Um, but you know, primarily bisexual on coming out day. That was a statement. Like we care about you. It's not just some lip service thing. We care about you, and here's what we're doing to show you. And it's also, um, and yeah, it's also a big plug to sell that that issue. I mean, because I mean, it's because of the way the industry works. Think you know, books are solicited, you know, months ahead of time. Um, so it was kind of like big reveals, like open the page and see what happens for the first time. Kind of doesn't happen because people, if there's some big thing like Doctor Strange dies or whatever, they um, they want you to know about it so you'll buy the damn thing. Right. So, I mean, that's, I mean, yeah, of course they want to make money, but it's not, they're not just doing this for money. Like there's people in the office that care super deeply about this. 
So sure, please, and, and please accept my word when I say that. There's people that care a lot about this issue. I agree, and I and I, I mean that's why the pride issues I think that they've been putting out the last couple of years are great, both DC and Marvel. And yeah, man, I, I, like you said, it's representation of of everyone getting a chance mm -hmm. to really feel like I can connect with a, with a hero. No, I, I absolutely agree with you. Jason Inman uh, is joining us. It's uh, good to see you, Jason. You got to come back on War Balloon soon. Uh, Ringo nominee, I should say, Jason Inman. Jason's yeah. an awesome dude. Yep. And He's fellow veteran. Friend. What's that? Oh, fellow that's veteran. right, of course. Yes, indeed, a fellow veteran. Absolutely. Uh, he's curious which members of the new authority you enjoy writing the most in the World World Saga. And he says, keep kicking ass with the blue tights. And all the best to you, John. Thank you very much, Jason. Man, I've got to say Manchester Black. He is a joy to write. It's almost like writing Constantine. Kind, ah, con oh, my God. Cy Springer is going to kick my ass. Constantine. Um. Yeah, I really like how punk rock Manchester Black is, and um, he's just a joy to write, man. And I, I also really like writing Apollo and Midnighter, the way they play off each other. Um, that's really fun. There's a lot of banter in the uh, the Superman, Batman, the Authority book. There's actually some some pettiness between Midnighter and Batman. Or Great. On Because Midnighter and Batman, to my knowledge, if, there's, if somebody knows this to be untrue, I'm certain they're watching this show. But to my knowledge, Batman and, and Midnighter have not met in this current continuity and so they meet for the first time in this batman superman the authority book and midnight is kind of an asshole and it was really really fun to write that um so yeah it's hard to say but apollo and midnight are really fun and manchester black is stupid fun that's awesome deviant uh i wants to clarify that uh he doesn't blame the writers he just finds it sad for the storytelling okay man no so Devi so um I mean, he can. Hey, thanks, DC Patrol. So to do uh, do right by Div uh, Deviant Porg. Um, so you just wanted it to be like a big splat, like a a big surprise, I guess. Is is yeah, what he wanted. Well, yeah, you know, for I guess for people to just discover it in the books, and so be it. And yeah. I get that certainly. I mean, it, you know, it's like when, you know, God, when um, Skyfall came out Friday morning, and everyone's like, you know, Bond fans mourn the passing of Judy Dench's character, Emma, and it's like. Hey, fuck you. I just bought the guy. I haven't seen a goddamn movie yet. It's 10 o'clock in the morning on Friday. Leave me alone. I know, man. You know, I know. so I, I, you don't know. And I get that, man. Believe me, I get that. And that's why I, I do everything I can. And it's so weird because we're all nerds and we want to know. But I'm like, I, I stay away from all production notes of TV shows and movies. And yeah, yeah. man, when the, when the, when the, when the comic book story hits the mainstream press, uh sometimes i'm happy sometimes i'm like oh i wish they would have just left it alone and also when it is something as sadly charged to to set off the culture wars it disappoints me and dean kane disappointed me this week and sure i mean uh, you know yeah that's yeah. his role now though right like whenever that whenever something happens in the comics they they trot him out um yeah so yeah that's and he word. doesn't and he doesn't read the comics, but you know, again, he's been, you know, he's been so well, yeah. He said something about like you can't say the truth dresses in the American way in comic anymore. And um, I, I wrote that in the book this year. <laughs> truth dresses in the American way was in a book this year, and um, and I think it was in a book last year by someone else. So he kind of doesn't know what he's talking about anyway. Um, he's just part of that machine and wants to make people angry online. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, someone wanted to know about Connor Kent. And that's something that I would really like explored more. Um, Straw Rabbi, off topic, after Suicide Squad revealed two versions of Connell uh, was done to explain the difference between the character from the 90s to the 2000s, will he get to interact with John more? Uh, not okay. That's he's Connor does not have a part in the story I'm telling now, but I do think that Connor is a kick ass character and really underserved. Um, he is in some cool stuff right now and stuff coming up, but um, the pro, I mean. I know what this is, this comment is going to lead to because I mean there's there's still the um all the anger about John being older is still around. Sure. It's definitely a low, low rumble for a while. But um aging him up also kind of created the problem. Now we have two two young supermen. Yeah, two are, super boys or supermen. Yeah, absolutely. Who are approximately the same age and look pretty similar. Um, so it's you really have to work hard to differentiate between them. And it kind of doesn't make sense to have two of them together. Like there's um, in the dynamic and team books and stuff. So um, 
you know, so people would sometimes ask me why I don't have Connor. Like, you know, that we have that iconic picture that Daniel Semperi drew at that Adriano Lucas colored of of uh, at the blockade between Atlantis and the U.S. of Clark, Kara and John coming down out of the sunlight. And it's like this amazing Superman image. And some people are like, where the hell is Connor? This sucks. And um, there's only so many pages in a book. And I didn't want to just have Connor show up and not say anything or like have any kind of character development or anything. I already kind of, I was called out for that Kara is not around. That just, she doesn't speak at the end of her scenes in 1035. And honestly, that was a fair criticism. I feel shitty about that. She was at the funeral thing in, in 1035, but she was, she, we didn't have like a proper goodbye. Yes. And we're just, we're just out of pages straight up. And it, it sucks. And I, um, looking back, I wish I'd found a way to give Kara more, more her due. Cause it was such a pleasure to write Kara the way I see her. Um, other writers are the right, right of the way I see her. I love that she's like the older cousin and that she's out of, she's by far the most Kryptonian of any of them and knows the most about Krypton. Um, I, I wanted to use it as much as I could. And I really want to use Kara again. Um, but I was already kind of short shrift in her, I feel like, as far as character development. And if I'd thrown Connor in there too, man, there's, that's, there's just no place for him. Well, Connor, not with the malice that um, Jason Todd has, but Connor really is kind of, uh, slightly outside the family just because of the way he was created and yeah totally his dna and everything and it's um and i think i and I, and i'm sure a lot of connor fans would say this as well i think there is a great opportunity to show that contrast yeah both and I, and you know i have this uh i have this love of broken things and especially like in comics i love the broken sidekick like i've always loved bucky and Jason Todd above, like, I love, love, love those characters. And um, Connor's not broken, but he is definitely kind of the black sheep of the super crew. If you're, if you're talking about Kara, his first cousin, his actual son, his wife, and then there's Connor, who's his clone. And it's not even exact. It's not just his clone. There's, I mean, he is the black sheep in that way. I think that makes him super interesting. And I would love to see more of stuff with him. I do kind of like him in the context of Suicide Squad. I'd love to see him and I'd love to do like a, you know, Red Hood and the Outlaws kind of thing with, yeah, anyway, I, I should shut up. <laughs> There's stuff I want to do with Connor. I really like Connor a lot. That's and, cool. Uh, people kind of assume I don't like him, but that's not the case at all. There's just not a place for him in this particular story. Um, but I would deeply love to use Connor down the road. And, uh, you know, Wesley's saying uh, everything counts. Uh, Connor was adopted by the Kents. Oh, no, I get that. Yeah, and again, you're right, absolutely. But it's just kind of just kind of cut from his, a different piece of cloth. I, I again, uh, just because of the way he was created, and I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's yeah. an interesting thing. And uh, by I'd the like way, I'd like to see more of that. I'd, I'd like to see uh, the relationship between him and the Kents a lot more. Like, see how because I mean, they they know Clark when he was little, not little, sorry, when he was younger. Um, but then Connor, seeing Connor at a similar age. Uh, how I would love to explore those kind of differences and sure. maybe even like a, a parallel story kind of thing where we get to compare how they, you know, compare the differences and that, that would help flesh Connor out more as a character too, and show how he's different, like right on the page. Absolutely, man. It'd be things I agree with him too, that uh, it'd be great to see more of power girl in the dynamic as well. Yep. So I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know what the plans are for uh power girl. I mean, man, I, we've been waiting good Lord ever since, um, uh, the end of uh, J uh, Jeff's uh, story with Watchmen and uh, Superman and everything, and now I'm blanking. What the hell was that called? Doomsday Clock? Yeah, Doomsday Clock. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Uh, sure. But, I mean, we've been waiting for a Justice Society book. It's like, God damn it. Put the That'd goddamn thing out. And we got a little bit of it in Scott's Justice League run, I guess. Yeah, Johns would crush that, too. That's kind of his wheelhouse. So, uh, <laughs> that's so funny. Well, yeah, and, oh, by the way, all right, so uh, – uh, DC Patrol wants uh, B things to know. Oh, that's right. In one star squadron. So that's cool. Mark that's Russell cool. is going to be so good at that. He's, he's so good at these, at those kind of books. Like, like it's not, it's not like a Trinity kind of book, but it's these, oh uh, yeah. I can't wait to see that book. Mark Russell. Absolutely. Great. What about, uh, pardon <laughs> Oh man. I'm so sorry. John Henry Irons. They want to know. Oh God. What do I say? Uh Oh, we've, we've hit a third rail. Shit. I think you've said enough if you want to leave yeah. it at that. So, uh, yeah. I panicked. So there. It's out there. <laughs> A lot revealed right there, everybody. Well done. Uh, that's hilarious, man.
Um, no, honestly, I'm, I'm very excited for the story you're telling, dude. Um, who's all right? Why am I blanking on Natasha? Who's Natasha? Oh, Natasha's his daughter. It's um, she's in the, the she's in the authority right now. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. <clears throat> I'm with you now. All right. Sorry, everybody. You'll forgive me. I don't know why. I've, I've, all of a sudden, Swiss cheese said, "I'm Sam Beckett." Sam Beckett must have jumped into me, and I'm not, <laughs> and I'm not uh, quite clear on everything tonight. Um, uh, someone earlier had said that they're really loving the aliens run or the alien. Oh, run, thanks. Yeah, we're in, we just started a new arc. That dude, it's a great story, and I love. And of course, with your military background, you really are kind of a perfect guy to tackle this kind of story. It's it's tremendous. Thank you so much. Yeah, I was really happy how the first arc turned out. Um, yeah, I, the, the military stuff was was helpful in just getting a getting a shorthand of the jargon just right and make it feel like a legit like make these guys feel like fighters and <clears throat> the way they kind of mess with each other. There was a uh, so very often it's it's funny like the the kind of work that I do very often there would be like a, a silent drill team there or something the guys that fling the bayoneted rifles around. And they look so squared away when they're out there. And um, hearing them, hearing those guys banter, like backstage, is kind of is kind of fun. And it's they're not how you expect them to be, kind of. And I wanted to work some of that like shit talk into the into these guys who are who they look so official and like marine like. And then uh, you hear them talk, and they're just kind of messing with the old guy. And there was a their original scene in issue two where those you see those guys for the first time the um the banter between them was much less flattering <laughs> they're all kind of kind of dopey and um but uh I, it just it didn't it didn't wasn't hitting the right tone so i i went back and revised it but anyway um yeah it's kind of the getting the right superman and alien at the same time was so cool is so cool because superman is like the the ideal father right clark Kent is the ideal father at least I, in the way i write him that's what i want him to be i want to i want a superman that's better than me in all ways i don't want a superman i don't want to write a superman that you know where readers are kind of yelling at the at the book like no man do like this you're messing it up i want the this ideal dad that we all want and want to be sure um <clears throat> uh in alien is kind of like this cautionary tale where this the main character in that book is this company man who screwed it up to the nth degree and kind of the worst possible scenario as a father where everything went as wrong as it can go. Um, so yeah, it was just a very different kind of therapy, I guess, right? In that character. Uh, just a, yeah, just like a warning to myself to make sure I play with my son every day and don't, you know, don't choose work and um, get to tell a story that really matters underneath the genre stuff. And like really still hit all the beats I wanted to hit as a, as a hardcore alien fan, but still tell a story that hopefully people will get a lot out of and mean something to them too. This next arc we're doing now is called alien revival. And that story means a lot to me too, in a very different way. Um, I wanted to, well, okay. I'll, I'll tell you, there's probably, I think I'll probably have a friend listening. Unless, I guess it's late over there. Maybe not. Um, I got some, some new friends in the UK named Laird's. Uh, there's a, a woman on Twitter named Michaela Laird who's been super supportive of my work. She's very involved in um, comics and like from the, through the lens of academia, like she teaches, oh, great. Stuff, teaches stuff about comics and is getting advanced degrees dealing with comics. It's really pretty awesome. And her mom is the super hardcore alien fan. And she was in, um, I want to say she was in an accident of some kind that messed up her spine a bit. And uh, I left her in a, in a place where she has, it's, it's given her a lot of problems and it's just complicated her life. It's a, it's a big part of her life now. And um, she's such a lovely person and has said such awesome things about Alien and been so supportive of the books. And Michaela's great too. And uh, the mom's name is Jane Laird. And um, I just kind of conceived of this idea, this story. I was already kind of kicking around the, the loose bits of it, but I, I am um, kind of, the pieces kind of coalesced and made the story about a, a religious sect called the spinners who on earth are persecuted in the, in the Southern United States. And they were approached by the United Americas about um, running a terraforming colony off world. Now, usually Whalen Utani, the company is the one that does all that kind of stuff. But now the UA is getting in the terraforming business. They're like, Hey, if you'll run this for us and if it's successful, we'll annex it to you. So it'll be our like territory, but it'll belong to you. Like, you know, Utah or whatever. Okay. And they end up doing it. And uh, so now there's this kind of like there's these space Amish that kind of like run this 
terraforming colony on a moon called Eurydice. And there's this woman who has a um, this woman named Jane who has um, a, a disease that's slowly taking her control away of her own body. And she's terrified of being trapped inside her own body. And uh, if she was not a spinner, she could get it treated. Like she's trapped in her own body because of her faith. And if she had just, if she just threw up her hands and left, she could have gotten it fixed, but she didn't. And um, then everything goes horribly wrong due to some, uh, some sabotage. And, and this woman whose body is falling apart, who's afraid of this thing inside her that's killing her, has to protect her own flock from uh, the perfect organism. Uh, it's a really, it's a, it's a mashup I'm really excited for. Um, I, I get to see, you get to see xenomorphs in the context of like old world Appalachia kind of a setting. Like, you know. Wow coal mines and villages sure. and, and uh, a setting we haven't been able to see before. Like there was this, there was a scene in this, in the Vincent Ward script for alien three that never got, never got produced of aliens like running through the cornfields, you know, and um, we never got to see that. And now, now we do. That's great, man. Very cool. Oh, yeah. I'm, God. I'm really excited about it. And it, it ramps up quick. I was a little worried that issue seven, the first issue of the second arc is issue seven. I was kind of afraid that it was too slow that people weren't going to cling on to it, but man, it ramps up quick. <laughs> Stuff happens in issue eight and nine that it's a, uh, it's a kind of a firecracker right out of the gate after seven. That's cool. That's amazing. See, I was going to lean on the military side and ask you uh, doing alien and stuff. And now and again, maybe uh, this is already something that's been burning in you or not. Uh, any, any Sergeant rock or Sergeant Fury uh, stories uh, burning in you. I'd love that. Yeah, I think it'd be, it'd be really fun to do one of those. Um, I will say that doing the, I did get, so doing Cap so early, I did that little Cap miniseries. Yeah, yeah. Doing that so early in my in my career, right before Superman, kind of did me a disservice. And there were some, uh, I mean, obviously I'm not going to say no to Cap ever. I mean, I love I love Cap. Um, but the the mission statement for that book was, you know, aliens are invading Earth. We want you to... Like we want Cap to round up all the militaries all around the world and lead them into battle against the Katati while the Avengers and Fantastic Four and X-Men are all doing their thing. So Cap is not with superhumans. He's with, you know, militaries. Yeah. And I was like, cool, we'll bring S.H.I.E.L.D. into it too. And they're like, actually, S.H.I.E.L.D.'s not in the books right now. Like S.H.I.E.L.'s dead right now. I was like, okay, so we'll make up our own new howling commandos out of modern day soldiers. And um, there's some people didn't like that and thought I was as a soldier, active duty soldier now, they assumed that I was just kind of using that as my propaganda vehicle. And when I got out to Superman, they got real nervous ah. that, that Superman was going to be a big, like, buy war bonds, kind of like old school, like <laughs> propaganda piece, you know? Um, and that's not what I wanted to do at all. But I get how people were jittery because that was the last thing they'd seen from me was this Captain America story. Sure. And Ooh, they didn't, know, story, that, they didn't know any of the and behind the scenes stuff. Like, the yeah, people, yeah. you know, that was the, the idea was military. That's why I got the gig. Sure. Um, so, but they didn't know any of that. So they got nervous. But anyway, that said, I feel like I've, I've written enough stuff now that I could write a Sergeant Rock story and totally get away with it and not, you know, freak anybody out. Sure. Um, and I would love that. I'd love to I like the idea of doing a Sergeant Fury story too. If I get to go back in time and do, do uh, the original Nick Fury back in his heyday, I think that would be super awesome. In fact, if I get to do that with a young Bucky, like young psycho Bucky as established by Brubaker, that would be the best that's a great idea oh my god that's a great idea let's do this so if we got a Please. team back then so we got nick fury sergeant fury two eyes yes got, we've got young bucky yep uh we've got i'm gonna say peggy carter sure who else logan well you got dumb dumb you got logan you got um i mean obviously the crew the howlers themselves who have worked side by side with bucky and maybe that's the first indication of Hey, the kid's not right. You know, he's a little too trigger happy. He's a little too, he's starting to love this a little too much. That kind of thing. And, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. That would be so fun. What about, oh, I think that's a great idea. Absolutely, man. We could do like an inglorious bastard style kill squad and that'd be cool. Yeah, no, absolutely, man. Well, that, and again, that's why they're now, and I, and I love that they did this in the movies. They gave a, a texture to the howlers and it's a shame. I, well, thankfully, in Agent Carter, we got a little bit more of that in the series and stuff. But it's like, oh, those are great characters. And I, I really hope that in some form we get more uh, of a look back at the 40s and stuff. And then, like you said, I mean, it started with what uh, what, Ed, what Ed did with uh, the Winter Soldier and everything. And it's like, 
oh, Bucky was a little badass. Oh man, and and yeah, how how much did that really affect him and stuff? I love that, that character. I love the idea of Cap being this this big blonde, blue eyed, you know, guy, and Bucky is this scrawny little psycho. And I just, oh god, I would love that. Yeah, okay, yeah. hard yes, let's do this. That's awesome, man. Uh, a good, nice, uh, nice comments about Lost God, Last God, by the way. Here, oh, great. Uh, there we go. Uh, he hopes that we'll get more in the future. Oh, uh, man, thank you, Amoeba. And also, uh, DC Patrol says, Last God is how I heard of you. So, oh, that's awesome, awesome, man. Man, that was that so, book was so much work, but it was so worth it. I, all the all the back matter took so much effort, but it was such a joy to work on. Um, yeah, Ricardo Federici is so great, and in fact, <laughs> all right. I'm going to make an announcement. Okay. So this is not been revealed anywhere. It's going to be real right here, right Thank now, you, man. That's always nice. Thank you. Um, so issue 1036 action comics, 1036 is coming out on November 9th, as we discussed. So it's Batman, Superman, the authority on November 2nd, and then action comics, 1036 on November 9th. That's the first issue of the war world saga. And then we have the excellent Miguel Mendoza, doing issues 1037 and 1038 okay so that's november december okay. doing those two issues. he's just coming off of justice league last ride with chip zarsky zarsky excuse me and yeah. in january like so solicitations for january came out today but there was a mistake in there it says that miguel is going to be drawing issue 1039 as well but he's not we're bringing on a new artist for 1039 and that is when the the sword and sandals, Robert E. Howard stuff really gets rolling. Okay. The issue that comes out in January, 1039, is when you're in a full-on Frank Frazetta painting with Superman and Mongol in it. <laughs> and that is going to be illustrated by the great Ricardo Federici. And he's going to be on action then forward. Oh, wow. Wow. Um, like I... the uh, of Last God fame. So if, if you like The Last God... Every page I draw, excuse me, every page I write of Action Comics from 1039 on is is drawn with Ricardo in mind. We're going to be giving him the most epic shit he's ever drawn. And it's all going to be in the context of Superman. And I am so incredibly excited about it. That's great, uh, man. That's finally the heavy metal uh, Superman comic we've all uh, waited for. Exactly. Heavy metal Superman is what it is. Absolutely. No, that's terrific, man. So if you that's saw those, those variant covers on, on the Future State books with Ricardo on it, uh, that's what the interior is going to look like. <laughs> it's so great. Anyway, I can't wait for you to see. Well, uh, the, the peanut gallery is uh, really excited for this. So uh, good. Yeah, uh, I'm flashing your, uh, the comments that they're making. Jump into the comics here. That's amazing, man. Yeah. Feel, feel free to scan through and everything and, and look at uh, the nice things that everybody is saying, but yeah, that sounds great. That sounds wonderful. And, uh, yeah, man, I'm, I'm a, I'm a massive easy company fan and I'm a big howlers uh, fan. I think they're, they're, very unique and and really especially uh especially in the case of uh, rock and when Qbert and and uh, Robert um and I'm forgetting his name now but the original writer and stuff I mean those those things were like amazing little stories I know I loved him just his just, and his I got some of his later rock stuff too like the um God I can't remember what it's called the I think I've got it over there with Azarello or um Sorry, I th I'm not sure it's on that on that shelf. Might be downstairs. There's a no. It's Kubert. I think Kubert did the whole thing Just by himself. Sure. I, I think he drew it and wrote it. Yeah. Um, the something not not like the Crucible or something like that, but that's not it. Anyway, I whatever. It yeah, was, I, I I know what you're talking about. Well, and I mean, my God, when he was doing up until his death, those Joe Kubert presents DC issues, and it was just so reassuring. That I mean, literally to the end, the man had not lost a step. They were beautiful. They were epic stories, and and just yeah, I I I, I don't know if you ever got to meet him. I got to meet him briefly a no. couple of times. Uh, Jimmy and Amanda really did me a solid. Uh, uh, Palmiotti and Amanda Connor. Sure, sure. And they were coming back from dinner or some late night hangout or something, and uh, they you know Joe Joe talked to me for a few minutes, and they were very patient about it and stuff. And yeah, Joe was great. And then I talked to him a few more times that same weekend. And I regret never having him on Word Balloon. But man, what a cool guy. He was amazing. Man, I wish I'd met him. I um, I keep bumping into Frank Miller. And, and I, I, I've i yet to talk to him because I just don't want to bother him. Because people are always hanging on him. And I just, 
you know, I, I did the same thing with, Jim, uh, excuse me, Jim Lee. I have met Jim Lee, uh, Stanley. Oh, sure. Uh, I bumped into him several times and I just leave him alone. Cause I mean, he's, he's always got people following him around and, and Joe was kind of this, I'm sorry. I never actually saw, I've never seen Joe. Um, but I keep bumping into Frank Miller and I just, I don't know. I just don't want to bother him. Um, at some point, there. at some point I will, at some point I'll take a minute and be like, Hey, I really love some of your stuff. I understand. Uh, DC Patrol, good question. Do you ever buy pages from the books you work on? Because I can only imagine how gorgeous those pages would be. To this day, I have not actually bought a page from a book I worked on, sadly. I, I need to. I should. Um, but I have been gifted a lot of pages, which has been friggin'. Yeah. So I actually, let me pull one up. Have I ever shown you this page sure. before? I don't remember. Maybe, maybe not. But by all means, no. Let's all do right, it for on. the people tonight. Absolutely, man. I always know it's going to be good when I talk to Phil, everybody. That's that's the great thing, man. Oh, I'm wearing pants, thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So two pages. God, what do I show you first? So both of them are masterpieces. All right. So this is from the great oh. Phil Hester. Yay. That's awesome. great. Yeah, it's a big, uh, big page from – that might be the first page of uh, my first – Non future state Superman issue. This was Superman 29, I think. Yep. Um, it's incredible work inked by Eric Gapster, I believe. Yeah, Eric Gapster. Yeah, Superman 29, page page four, according to according to uh, the top. And then uh, I met Ricardo Federici a couple of years back at New York Comic Con, and he had his portfolio with him with all that stuff, and he had the la he had all the like the issue two and three pages with him. And he let me pick one, and I I, I deliberated over wow. which which uh, which one to choose, like yeah. twenty minutes or something. So yeah, this is when he um, I picked this one because it well, first of all, it's friggin' unbelievable, of course. But um, it also what's happening on the page at that moment is uh, there's a a poem that I wrote, like a song that I wrote for the book that's yes. appearing yes. In, in, in captions with little music notes on there. Yes. And um, so I keep me, I need to get off my ass and get this done. I'm going to frame it, this page with a handwritten copy of the sheet music as well. I'll put it like one little, you know, presentation. Yeah, thing. that's great, man. Um, that's amazing. I'm really proud of that song too. It's like, it's a, it's a, a poetry form that I made up. And I really like, I like, um, um, oh my God. Uh, the poetry form Japanese five seven five haiku. I really like haiku. Um, I like that they start on the strong beats and everything, but I also like iambic pentameter, which is you know ten syllables per line, uh, and it, it always starts in the weak beat. And I kind of neither one of them suits music all that well, so I kind of made up a new form for the songs in Last God that the Elva would use, and um, that was one that I kept and used in the interiors. Anyway, I'm going way down the nerd hole, so I apologize. I love this. No, I, no, um, no. Are you kidding? Philip, absolutely not. You know that. Come on, man. You've been on enough. People love yeah. this stuff. And seriously, I mean, I, you're good Lord. Everyone is saying how much they appreciate uh, this level of love that you have for your stuff. And uh, absolutely, man. No, this is oh, great. Man. Oh, here's a nice one. Greetings uh, from Chile. I'm buying your run on my local comic shop. Comics arrive <laughs> a month after they're released in the new, in the U.S. I'm, I'm loving I'm loving your stuff. And Thank yes, you so here much. at DC in Nerd Hole, that's where I live, hundred percent, man. Good <laughs> yeah. Lord, yes. Um, now, someone asked earlier, and I know the answer to this question, I believe. But uh, here, uh, Wolf E wants to know where should I jump back to get the full scope of your run, uh, uh, thanks, starting man. with Future State. I, I would say yes. Yeah, I'd say yes if you can. Yeah, if it's if it's convenient for you to get those issues. Um, I wrote Superman Worlds of War one and two. And Superman, uh, Future State Superman, House of L. House of L. Yeah. It might be House of L number one, but there's just the one issue. Yep. Um, if you cannot get those, uh, don't worry about it uh, because the, I mean, it does kind of give, it gives a lot of, you know, Easter eggs for things that come. Yeah, the, the groundwork. Yeah. And I'm very proud of those issues, actually. Those are kind of my mission statement on what Superman is and who he is. I'm, I really am proud of those. Um, I've kind of put everything I wanted to say about Superman in one thing in case I got hit by a bus. <laughs> it's, all, it's all in those pages. Um, but then there is a two part arc right after that um, Superman 29 and Action 1029. And that was a two part arc that we wrote really late in the game because my, my Action Comics run was supposed to start like with 29. 
And then they were like, because due to some scheduling stuff, we need to, we're going to do a two-parter between action and Superman. And I was like, okay, that doesn't fit with anything I've got going on. And they're like, that's the gig. I was like, all right, here we go. So, and we had an opportunity to work with Phil Hester, who was the man. I mean, I love working with Phil. He's so cool. Super nice. Great guy. I mean, I mean, I mean, monster artist, clearly. Yes. So I, yes. yeah. So I just thought of another story that I called the golden age that I wanted to write specifically for Phil because his art style is just so beautiful. So anyway, I am rambling again. So uh, Superman 29, 1029 and action 1029 is a two part story that does. There are aspects of that story that do matter later in in action. But once again, you don't like half. You're not gonna be lost if you don't read it, but it does inform stuff that you see like next th this month. Um, and then the actual arc called War World Rising goes from 1030 to 1035 that just hit. That just finished. It's wrapped up, yeah. Yeah, and that'll be coming out in a trade probably in a couple of months, I would imagine. Um, there's also the trade called The One Who Fell that collects my Superman issues. Um, that doesn't exactly lead into, well, I mean, the Superman 29 and Action 1029 are in there, but then there's also the Superman three-parter that I wrote for my son that's in there too. And I am proud of that too, but it doesn't, yeah. it's not like required reading for action. No, but it's, a, again, it's great characterization and great story. Absolutely, man. Thank um, you. Andrew Sweet, another different run of yours, wants to acknowledge the Carnage, Extreme Carnage run. Do you have any plans to write more Flash Thompson? I loved your interpretation of the character in Extreme Carnage. Oh man, I'd love to. I the way it all the way it all turned out at the end of that story, I would love to do an X Force style, like kind of hit squad, like a like a symbiote hit squad. I think that'd be super fun. And we have all the characters on the board to do that now. Like the way it left up with with uh, with Flash, um, Andy, and uh, let's see the kid, the Toxin. I can I forget the kid's name, Bren. I think Bren, uh, the Toxin host. And uh, and Hank, I got to inv invent this character named Hank, who was a, uh, a vet that Fl uh, Flash knew from his army days. He's kind of this down and out guy, kind of wants his, his life to mean something. And he gets an opportunity to um, <laughs> to be a part of something bigger than himself, that really realizing it and uh, set up this whole, you know, kill squad kind of thing uh, that I think we really fun to do more of. Now, I'm, I kind of don't have the bandwidth right now to do that book, but I would happily pass it off to another you know, writer or, or take over it myself if there's an opportunity. But yeah, Flash is a really cool character. I, uh, you know, I grew up seeing him just being the the dick that was always messing with Spider Man, but seeing him there actually use him in a cool way, like the Remender run, and all that. I thought that turned out really great. Oh, I agree. Yeah, yeah. I, I loved Venom uh, on, on with Rick's uh, run, absolutely. And mm -hmm. I agree with you. I think they've really uh, given more depth to Flash over the years, and that's great because Flash. I mean, uh, you know, and again, part of the soap opera, it's like. Oh yeah, actually, Flash is a good guy. You know, I always love. Uh, it was it was still Stan writing. I think back in the day, it was a shocker story where Flash came home on leave, and Peter was just being really, really douchey to him. And Gwen is like, "How dare you? That man is out there serving his country, putting his ass on the line, and you have the nerve to talk to him like that. What have you ever done, Peter?" And oh, walks away. It's like, ah, 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 ah. right. <laughs> But it was great because Flash wasn't being a jerk. He was being a decent guy. And I think Peter was just jealous and everything. And like, hey, get back off, man. That's my girl or whatever. Right. And it was just, yeah, it was a great moment of like, how dare you? And it's like, oh, if only you knew what I do. But, yeah, no. but also, I mean, his his just devotion to Spider-Man. And then finally, when he really, you know, he, he finds out, I think that's awesome. I think that's great. And he's become a great ally for Peter. Yeah, I like the character a lot. I'm uh, I would love to write him again. Um, somebody see Kenneth just asked me if I finished Superman and Lois. Yes, and I was I about to put that up. Indeed, yeah. What did what did what did you think of the wrap up? You know, that? I I did not finish the series because I got so busy with uh, with writing I couldn't finish it. But I, I I did watch most of it and liked it very much. And I'm actually rewatching it right now. Um, I went back to the beginning because I've it's been so long since I've since I was caught up. Sure. Um, I went back to the beginning. I've been watching it with. Uh, with my son with a little bit of, uh, you know, a little bit of, um, yeah, editing. I don't, I don't want to watch every single thing. I don't want him to hear about, you know, eh, we're all doing drugs out here. Let's all, you know, party by the oil barrel. But, um, <laughs> I understand. um, but yeah, I let him watch the cool parts. <laughs> and, That's cool. Um, God, yeah, so we've was... been, uh, we've been watching that together and I, 
I, I actually like it more second time through. And it's, I really do like Tyler's interpretation of him. Um, there are things in a writing, I'm, I don't know, I'm going to get lit up, but I'm just going to tell the truth. I, I think that it shows him a little more vulnerable and uh, vulnerable and um, susceptible to weakness and bad judgment than, uh, than I would like to see in Superman, at least in the version I'm writing in the comics. Sure. I mean, he's, he's never like totally, totally screwing the pooch, but he, but there are times when he, um, the example I gave the other day online that I'm going to use again is when he took one son to the fortress and not the other um, because the right. one son had powers and not the other. Like it was such a lame thing to do as a father that I, you know, I don't want to judge Superman as a dad. Like I'd be like, Hey, I wouldn't have done that. That's stupid. interesting. Sure. I, I want him to show me how to be a better father, you know? So I, there's stuff like that, that, or they, he comes home and he's super stressed and he and Lois get wine drunk. And so it just seems like, um, I want to see Superman a little more wise, I guess, and squared away. Um, but that said, they did some really cool stuff in that, in that story. And I thought Tyler does a great job and most of the, and he does own up to his mistakes and he and Lois, I love how Lee and Lois are such a team and they, yeah, you know, they kind of, you know, strengthen each other's weaknesses and stuff like the, the relationships between the family members are all really great. And um, there's a, I mean, the strengths far outweigh the problems for me. Sure. Um, I would not write Superman in quite that way, but I'm super picky in that way. And I think there's a lot of stuff that the show does really terrifically. You've heard my uh, Star Trek nitpicks, so I don't. Blame <laughs> yeah. Off, yeah. I don't, I don't listen to all of them because I'm not actually much of a Star Trek guy, but I know that you have very strong opinions about Star Trek for sure. No, and and honestly, I do feel like someone telling me with Star Trek, where I would say to you, obviously, well, you know, uh, he's you know he's he's not the assured Superman of your <laughs> books. He really is still a kind of learning, and I almost kind of understand in terms of, wow, we didn't see this coming. Yeah, that, you know, we, we always knew it was going to happen. Uh, that <laughs> eventually, powers will kick, might kick in with one of them or both of them. But I agree with you that yeah, I. I'm really glad they didn't. Well, I don't want to spoil this, the season, but I'm really glad they didn't uh, like make the choice to make Jonathan, the non-powered uh, son, uh, evil or seduced by a dark side kind of influence or whatever. And it's like, right. uh, no, no. And I love how the brothers look out for each other, and yeah. Jonathan really is like doing everything he can to support his brother. And everything. yeah, I mean, at the, at the beginning, like, I didn't, I didn't like. I didn't like that they were setting up Jordan at the beginning to be like the the jerk, you know. Yeah, he was a little too emo. Yeah, he, yeah, yeah, exactly the emo sulky brother. But I was like, clearly this is a starting point. His arc is going to be very different. And I, I was, there's no problem to look past it. <clears throat> um, Agreed. But uh, I kind of the whole disagreement on. I see that Kenny really likes that version, and that's awesome. Like I'm, I'm not here to yuck anybody's yum. I think if you love sure. that character, that's awesome. I that's absolutely terrific. I, uh, I did get lit up online because there was a uh, – I did a panel at New York Comic Con with Stephanie Phillips, who you've, you've had on. Absolutely. I love Stephanie. Stephanie and I are great, great. friends. She's Stephanie's terrific. really cool and a great writer. And we were on the panel, and somebody got me going about who my version of Superman was. I don't remember exactly how it was set up, but I okay. um, I talked about that. I talked about my my love for the Christopher Reeve version. And, I mean, I talked a little bit earlier in the show how I was that kid who really needed that that fantasy, you know? Sure. Just to believe that, you know, somebody who loved me sent me to this place and I'm, you know, I'm here to be stronger and help people and I have purpose and blah, blah, blah. Um, that was really important to me and it's a huge deal. And for me, that was Christopher Reeve. That's what that, that's what that dream looked like to me. Um, <laughs> so I talked about that and Screen Rant ran an article and I don't fault the writer. This is not the writer's fault. The right, the, the article was not super objectionable, but this, the title says something like, Action Comics writer said Henry Cavill's Superman is quote too relatable, and the uh, and the Scott and the, the Zack Snyder crew came after me super hard, and um, so I, I posted a you know a thread that explained my my thing. I, I was going to ignore it, but it just didn't let up. So I was like, fine. Here's what I actually said. Here's what I believe. Um, and I didn't actually. I never said the word is too relatable, you know, in that order. <laughs> I uh, I did say something like. Other people want to see Superman who they can relate to. And what I meant by that was I have a friend actually on another podcast, a super good dude who um, told me they really like seeing a Superman who struggles, who doesn't always know what the right thing is, who makes mistakes, who gets stressed out the way that, that he does. 
And um, that's not what I look for personally in Superman. I'm when I'm writing Superman, I'm trying to I'm looking for those key moments of inspiration. Um, I want to see Superman like float upward slowly with the sun behind him and the music swelling as he speaks, the drums and the Hans Zimmer version and the, the trumpets and John Williams score. And I, you know, for me, that's what I wanted to see. Like that, that, uh, that beacon of hope is like, everything's going to be fine. You're going to be, you're going to, you're going to grow up fine. Um, and for me as a guy with little gray hair in my temples, um, that was the Christopher Reeve Superman who appears outside the window and says, you know, general who's like a step outside you know that's that <laughs> old, that old version absolutely um but that doesn't mean i fault i understand that if i was 15 i would probably not feel that way <laughs> you know i uh you know this is a different generation superman and it's undeniable that that cavill is a more badass looking superman and that there are there are some moments in the, those movies that are very inspirational that are exactly the moment i'm talking about where he's like floating and people reaching up to him like he's the savior and oh god yes absolutely. you know there are those moments that are just sure. like i'm talking about Sure. You know, and I love that. I there I love those moments. Those are the moments I'm trying to, to get in my uh in my writing, but in my mind, because of how crucial um that those old versions were to me in the in the comics and in those movies, I see Christopher Reeve in my mind. But uh but there are moments in these new movies where that's that's Cavill as well. I do say I um I mean he looks amazing, right? I mean he's super yeah. jacked. The he, Cavill looks like Linneal, he looks like Linneal Yu. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, uh, exactly. Linneal yeah, Yu's right. Drawing come to life absolutely super jack the cavill costume definitely looks cooler in live action in my opinion than the than the classic truer one the truer one the comics um in live action um in the comics i want to seem like they are but um i'm always going to see the superman that i saw as a kid um and to me when when cavill's about to go into a fight his face sometimes says like i'm this unstoppable force and i'm you know i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna fuck you up you know like it's it's, it's it seems really aggressive and Reeves' face, the way he portrayed him, and just his body carriage and all that, is more a face of determination, but also one of compassion. Yeah, and concern. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, to me, to me, it. that face, and I, I understand that I'm seeing it through, you know, rose-colored glasses. I get that, but that's still a version I see. That face that says, "I don't want to hurt you, but I can't allow you to do this." Yep. You know, I agree. And, but, before anyone gives me any shit on here, I, I know he went back in Superman two and kicked that trucker's ass, and <laughs> but that's. Right. Uh, you know, but, you know, I'm just, I'm talking about the version I see in my head, my, in, in my head canon. That's not what Superman would have done. And uh, yeah, I just want that, that, the person who's only strong so that he can show us how un incorruptible he is. I'm with you, man. Uh, Radium wants to know uh, if you've been enjoying the Superman 78 comic book. <laughs> yes, intensely. Sure. Yeah. I, yeah. I just got, I just got caught up on it. And uh, yeah, it's it's really cool. I love seeing these different versions of characters that we never quite saw. And um, so awesome. agree, man. Absolutely. And that you know, I had uh, uh, Jam DiMatteis on uh, last uh, Tuesday, and that Justice League uh, that's based on the animated series. I'm like, this is an amazing Justice League story. What the hell are you doing, yeah, man? man. DC's great. killing it. DC's killing it. I yeah, I'm I I you know, honestly, congratulations to Josh and everybody that's been involved. Uh, good lord! Uh, watching DC uh, from a from a corporate standpoint is kind of like watching a uh, basketball, you know, kind of hit around uh, the rim, and you're not sure if it's going to go in or not. And it went in, and I and I really give all the creatives a lot of credit uh, to have that kind of weirdness above your heads and still manage to put out amazing stories. And I and I think everybody's doing it. And you know, you mentioned Stephanie, and I, she's. Absolutely, somebody that I uh, love when, when she's writing stuff. But Zdarsky, Mark Russell, all these new voices at DC, and Matt Rosenberg is another one. And it's like, holy shit! I mean, yep. this and of course yourself, man. And no, I'm I'm thrilled. I'm absolutely thrilled that this is all going on. Oh, okay, oh. hilarious! Radium wants to know if uh, <laughs> saw in, that. Uh, in Superman too. Yeah, will we get the uh, shield throw? In that's a hard room? pass, man. I'm sorry. I <laughs> I, I love it. Uh, for his nostalgia, but that's it's pretty stupid. It's <laughs> pretty either. goofy. Pretty goofy. It's not really. Yeah, I mean, I love Christopher Reeve. However, this is not Superman seventy eight, and I got a. It's a. It's a more. It is. I try to capture the badassery of of Henry Cavill's version with the compassion and humility and everything of the Christopher Reeve. You know, so it's not. Uh, not really a place for the for the cellophane shield. Yeah, I no, I get that. And truly, what I love about your Superman is this: like, okay, uh, you know, uh, peaceful negotiation is over. I gotta, I gotta get rid of this guy at yeah. all costs. 
and I love his speeches to the, the league and why he's doing what he's doing. And it's like, no, I can't wait for you. I've got to take care of this now. And, and it's got to be done. And it's it, the determination is, is pretty amazing. Yeah. So yeah, I'm with you, man. That's so funny. But uh, yeah, I'm with you on the cellophane. Uh, absolutely. So you have other people echoing what they're loving about uh, infinite frontier. Absolutely. I agree. And um, yeah, I, uh, I was going to say something about Superman and Lois, but just basically, no, I look forward to season two. I think they, I think they nailed it. And they I, did. And I they, did a good, uh, they did a really good job. It's not, you know, it's not the same version as I see in my comics, but it's, it's, I hear different, you. it's a different medium. You know, they're going for a, right. going for a family show. They made huge changes to Superman's uh, mythology to accommodate a family story set in Smallville. And um, that's totally fine. I like, think it's, it's that, you know, DC is famous for its multiverse and it's, I, it's a perfectly valid take that I really enjoy. You know, I missed your Aquaman annual. Tell me about it. Oh, that was my first DC thing. That was like in 2018, I think. Um, so I, let's see, Brian Cunningham, who's editing Justice League at the time, had seen Last Sons of America that I did at Boom. And he reached out. He was like, would you want to do something with DC? I was like, hell yeah, I've been reading your stuff forever. So I was in LA not long after that, and he and I met up. And um, he said, uh, Let's see. He was like, well, here are the books that I'm doing. And uh, I'd like to ask you to do an inventory issue for us. So for those who don't know, um, an inventory issue is when, you know, you, there's got to be a, a Batman book on the shelf every month. So they'll have a couple of inventory issues kind of in the wings just waiting to get used if something happens. If there's a delay, some, some illness or somebody falls way behind or sure. plans change for the line or whatever. So they have these other issues kind of ready to plug in if they were need to. Um they wanted to, uh, and it's a good way to try people out if they're sort of untested with superhero stuff. So they were like, uh, here are the books I do. We got, I'm doing, I can't remember all the ones that he said, but um, he said Aquaman, Flash. Um, I don't think it was Green Lantern. A couple others. Uh, Hellblazer. Maybe there was a Green Lantern in there. Something, something. And I was like, Hellblazer all day. Is I've I've read every word that dude's ever spoken in a book. Like I I love 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 Hellblazer. Cool. And he's like, actually, what we really need is Aquaman. <laughs> I was like, all right, cool. I'll take that. that's what I meant. I really love Aquaman. Let's do <laughs> and um, I was super ignorant of Aquaman. Actually, I didn't know much about him. I had read, you know, my knowledge of Aquaman went back to like the Super Friends days. It was like kind sure. of a long time ago. So I I boned up on Aquaman. That's, I went back and read uh, Jeff stuff from New Fifty Two, which was great. And all the stuff with the trench and everything. Um, yeah, yeah. Went back and read the old stuff too, and got because I wanted to. You know, I didn't know what I was doing. I wanted to get sure. to know that character and find a way to love him, and I, I did. I really found a way to love that character, and um, did a story. Um, well, I don't want to spoil it because if anyone picks that up that hasn't read it yet, there's a big yeah. Movie. But was, I was, haven't read it yet, so I'm looking forward to reading I'm, it. I'm real proud of it, man. Max Fumara drew it, and Dave Stewart colored it, and looks it looks fucking awesome. Those guys Great. crushed it. It was supposed to be two issues. Uh, they said I could do a one shot or two issues. <clears throat> and I wrote two issues, and then the following year, they ended up needing an annual, and like some, a ball got dropped, and they were like, "Oh crap, we need an annual in like three months." And they're like, "We got this thing just sitting here. Let's let's just let's just put uh, both issues in there as the the annual." And um, yeah, so we we ran it, and it turned out beautifully, and I couldn't be happy with the with the art in it, and it was that was my uh, my first first step into a larger world, as they say. <laughs> RBM Kingston agrees. He's like, uh, he remembers his uh, local shop telling him when he picked up the annual that it was his favorite Aquaman annual he had read in years. And after I read it, I agree. Oh, That's man. Awesome. Thank you so much. Man, very cool. got some nice people in this chat. I like Absolutely, it. Absolutely, man. Wesley loved it as well. Oh, well, great. That's great. Man. Yeah, it was the cool thing. Well, a cool thing about that was that it gave me a chance to do a little bit of world building in there. Because um, I'm kind of obsessed with Atlantis. I, at the, well, now I am. At the time, I was like, Aquaman, whatever. But now I um I I kind of get tired of seeing Atlanteans portrayed as just soldiers that all speak English and kind of look the same. And um you don't see much of their their commerce, their architecture, their culture, their language, their clothing, their how anything works, how sure. the technology works. It's all just like, you know, they're all just in the in the pool, you know. And um <laughs> And I wanted to see more of that. So I got to explore that a little bit in uh, in that annual. And it really made me want to do 
more Aquaman, honestly. Like I really, I know that's not that's like great. one of the selling books they do, but I love that character now. And I, I really like the idea of Atlantis. I'm glad I got to use him in War World Rising. Got to see a little bit more of, you know, their, how they interact with the surface world. That's what I was going to say, man. No, you got a great handle on Aquaman. Absolutely. Thank you. I appreciate that. You know, I, my favorite moment in terms of, I had never seen them do this before was watching the first season of Young Justice. And when they first introduce uh, that Aqualad and uh, he's having a conversation with Arthur and they're speaking Greek because yeah. of the Atlantis. I mean, and it I makes was, total sense. I was so excited. And it literally, I'm watching like with an old college roommate and I won't deny because it's legal here in the, uh, in Illinois. I was definitely uh, enjoying a little weed at the time. And I'm like, <laughs> Uh, that's Greek, and I know exactly what they're saying. <laughs> and it was great because they did have like subtitles, and I'm like, "Oh my god!" I'm like, and he goes, "Well, yeah, there's subtitles." I'm like, "No, no, no, you don't understand. I wasn't watching the screen, and I heard the Greek, and I'm like, why are they speaking Greek?" And I'm like, "Of course, they're Atlanteans. They're Greek. That's fantastic. That's awesome. awesome. Yeah, I um, I worked in some names of of ancient uh, rulers and a couple little words here and there, and I'll, I use Greek for all that. That a boy, absolutely." Um, you know, I got to remind my family of that when they, because they're like, yeah, with the comics. And I'm like, I should remind them, hey, man, what are you talking about? Aquaman, that's my big fat Greek wedding, like in a comic, when you think about <laughs> it. I love it, man. Hilarious. Yeah. Uh, character. All right. Again, Ken, Kenneth uh, echoing that the stuff he's read in action has been the best Superman I've read since Rebirth and the, and the Triangle Era. Very oh, cool. Man, wow. The, well, yeah, the Weekly Triangle Wait, Era. Who could forget? I just saw his picture. I think I know that dude. Kenny, did I meet you at a third eye in Virginia? <laughs> I guess we'll find out. Yeah, man. That's awesome. Anyway. That's terrific. Dude, are you like we could wrap up? I know it's late your time, and I appreciate you coming on later than uh, Yeah, if there's no more no more uh huge questions, but um John's pleasure as always, man. Oh, dude, you know it. I mean, good lord. And I really I can't wait to see you in Baltimore. That's gonna be great. Yeah, uh, oh yeah, yeah. That's right. Next weekend. Absolutely. And seriously, man, no, thank you. I, I good lord. I mean, uh this might be our sixth conversation. I haven't been keeping count, but every time it's always a pleasure. And and truly, I love what you're doing. And I'm glad they're giving you the canvas to work on. Oh, man, and I could not be happier at D.C. They're, they gave me such a long runway to to do this big, sprawling, epic thing that I mean, we're setting out to do something like, um, you know, the, like the Dark Phoenix saga. You know something? Oh, Robert Atkins, that dude's a killer. Yeah, I love Robert. It's been far too long. You're you're uh, long overdue to come on Word Balloon. That's my fault for not asking. I'm so glad you're joining us. And uh, you know, everyone, good lord, uh, Atkins is one of the best artists out there. Yeah, he's and I, you know, and a, and a tremendous guy. And he's got a very nice sister as well. I like their, I like the family. They're very nice people. Um, but no yeah, it's. it's they gave me a ton of, like I've I've got space to do this huge story that hopefully will be this evergreen thing for DC and uh, just my this big long statement about Superman and his legacy for the multiverse and his family a thousand years in the future and there's so much I want to say with it and we're we're adding so much to the mytho to the DC mythology and something we just couldn't do in like a six issue arc if they gave me like four issues or six issues sure. it would never have worked and uh, they're giving me this trust with uh, this character that I've grown up with and I just cannot be more grateful. I'm just loving it. Loving it. That's awesome, man. Well done. And uh, again, I'm, uh, you know, we were talking off the air. We uh, talked a little boxing and stuff and I'm, <laughs> glad, I'm glad you got to see uh, Fury Wilder three. It was amazing. Yeah. Those guys are incredible. I mean, it's, I've, I've seen a lot of boxing matches where they're kind of, you know, pacing themselves and it's like they're covered up the whole time and not a lot of, not a lot of heat's getting thrown. And that was not the case. That, that fight at all unbelievable yeah. and you know have you ever boxed in the service phil no not not for the army no i mean i've boxed while i've been in is that part of training or or whatever or uh, sort of there's a there's a the fighting system that they use is called combatives and it's i mean it's essentially mma it's like there's a, like a codified version that they it uses elements of elements of jujitsu and there's some very very basic striking that happens too um but you're not learning the kind of nuance you would get if you were just doing boxing for like a long time. Um, but there's, there are also more advanced levels of training, but it's, it's the kind of thing where you go for like, you do, you do nine to five, five days a week just for the one week. And then you're like level one and you do wow. two or three more weeks and then you're level two and then you're level three. Like it, the long, the higher level you go, the longer the training is to get that next level. Once you're level three, I think you're, you're enabled to teach level one. And it's, you know, 
there's a system, but it's not the kind of thing you study for like years and years and years. Um, so yeah, I've boxed while I've been in, but it's kind of been on my own time. Okay. Okay. I always, uh, no, I, I mean, um, I miss the collegiate boxing that used to happen and stuff. And I, and I know that the military would, would participate in yeah. those and everything. So, yeah, you know, and I'm, a, I've got my own little story burning. I'll tell you off the air of, uh, you know, if I, if I were able to do my screen, my boxing screenplay, uh, it involves uh, military boxing as well. So. Hmm, interesting. Yeah. I'd love to hear about that. There you go. All right. <laughs> well, I hope my position on bisexual Jonathan is clear <laughs> and, uh, and I, I want to get that out there because I know a lot of people are talking about it, but I also wanted to really push the fact that Clark Kent is still Superman and he's doing awesome stuff. The artists that are working on this book right now are incredible. And the War World Saga is the most epic thing that Superman has been involved with since the death and return. So I, I completely agree. It's a compelling story that uh, if you're not reading it and not, if you're not reading it, you're probably not listening to this. So I, I think yeah, please pick up action. Here. Action 1036. Please pick it up. We really want to sell that run out and reprint it because it's going to be awesome. No, an amazing art that's uh, coming to follow uh, in this World War, War World epic and everything. That's right. So, Ricardo Federici is coming. That's outstanding, man. Uh, again, it's the, the the heavy metal Superman we've all uh, yeah, wanted right. for years, and it's finally happening, so you don't want to miss it. And uh, the next chapter, November 2nd. That's right. Oh, November 2nd is Batman, Superman, and the Authority, which is technically the next chapter, yes. Yeah. And then that leads right into 1036, which is on November 9th, I'm told. I just yeah. I heard that today, so if it's not accurate, I apologize. But as of today, it's November 9th. There you go, man. Uh, well, I, it's funny. Uh, Nick at Night Night uh, says, continued success. Hope to see uh, Philip as a word balloon regular. Too late. <laughs> I'd love that. Philip is a word balloon regular, man. Are you kidding me? No, yeah, this man. is... Uh, Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I, whenever, whenever I want to talk to him or whenever he wants to talk to me, he knows communication Indeed. lines are very open and I'm always happy to have you back. Yeah, man. You know John that. is a, John is a perennial favorite. You're a good man. I appreciate that. Everybody. Thanks a lot for watching. Um, I've been slow on, I, I, I kind of had to take a break today for, for personal reasons as far as the audio coming out, but uh, all weekend you're going to get more word balloon and it's going to be a busy week. Uh, Monday night is Tom King, Tuesday night is Brad Meltzer, and I'm working on Wednesday, and I don't want to announce yet until it's uh, firm, but that's all going to lead to Baltimore, and then I'm going to be kind of busy with Baltimore uh, Thursday through Sunday, but, uh, you know, uh, likely you'll find audio and stuff, and also we've already been talking about trying to get together and uh, doing some other podcasts while in Baltimore with some of my regulars, like the Oh Yeah Guys and our Trek uh, watch and things like that. So we'll see what happens. I'm not, I don't do floor interviews anymore because I want to have long conversations like Philip and I just had. Yeah, man. So you know how it is, but, uh, but yeah, looking forward to seeing everybody in Baltimore. Thank you. And it's going to be a great week from word balloon before Baltimore. So have a great week.